Greetings, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever you're listening to this, uh, students, and welcome to another version of your APUSH summer assignment. Uh, today we are going to do lecture cast 1.4, and we're going to talk about uh, colonization by both France and England. But first, a irrelevant, useless piece of historical knowledge. Did you know that in Shakespeare's time, mattresses were secured on bed frames by ropes? Pulling on the ropes tightened the mattress and made it firmer. Hence the expression, good night, sleep tight. And now you know. Anyway, in today's edition, uh, we're going to answer a couple of essential questions. First, we're going to be able to identify the key figures in French and English exploration in establishing colonies in the New World. We're also going to be able to compare, hopefully, and contrast the causes for French and English uh, in exploration and colonization. So here we go. Uh, first and foremost, French exploration and its origins are different than that of the Spanish, which, if you remember, were the three G's, and the English, which was financial uh, and also to avoid religious persecution. And we'll get to that here in a minute. The French had uh, largely stimulated their economy by the beaver trade. And again, if you read your summer assignment in the textbook, uh, they reiterate that. European beavers were dying out because of overhunting and new fashions like hats uh, used a lot of beaver felt, which was why the discovery of the North American beaver was like a miracle to hat makers. Remember, supply and demand, the invisible hand, Adam Smith, call your office, uh, or in other words, no, just beaver. But anyway, uh, I digress. Uh, Giovanni de Verrazzano, uh, started this whole process, and in 1524, he sailed the American coast from Carolina to Maine. He was probably the first European to see New York Harbor and the first to establish French claims to the eastern United States. Also, Jacques Cartier uh, explored up the St. Uh, Lawrence River in the 1530s, and in response, Spain had erected, and we talked about this fort in one of the previous lecture casts, they erected Fort St. Augustine in Florida in 1565 to keep the French out of North American interior and the Caribbean. Next we have Samuel de Champlain, who is also known as the father of New France. He established Quebec in 1608, again, uh, a year after the English founded Jamestown in Virginia. Champlain was also responsible for alienating the mighty Iroquois Indians. This action would set the tone for the French and Indian War uh, over colonization, where the French were allied with the Huron and Algonquin tribes, and the British were aligned with the Iroquois. Some other French explorers uh, included uh, into the, uh, again, if you see on the, the slide here, the uh, Mississippi and Ohio Valleys, Antoine Cadillac, who founded uh, Detroit in 1701. He aimed to keep the English settlers out of the Ohio Valley. The American car industry has a love affair with the Native American names. And again, you want proof of that? Think about it. Pontiac, Cadillac, Jeep Cherokee, Dodge Dakota, Jeep Comanche, Pontiac Aztec, Ford Thunderbird, to name a few. I can go on, but quite honestly, at this point, I can't. Uh, Robert de La Salle also sailed from Quebec down through the Great Lakes uh, and down the Mississippi River in 1682 with the help of American Indian guides. His goal was to prevent the Spanish expansion into the Gulf of Mexico region. His legacy includes many Catholic schools which bear his name. It also includes the trend in French foreign uh, policy in making alliances with Native Americans, especially in checking the expansion of the British American colonies into the region. And oh yeah, he also coined the name Louisiana in honor of King Louis the Fourteenth. So just to uh, reiterate that, the French established posts in the Mississippi region. Uh, New Orleans uh, was in fact the most important in 1718. Um, and uh, they attempted to block the Spanish expansion, as I said, into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, they established forts and trading posts in Illinois country, uh, Kaskakia and Cahokia in Vincennes. Uh, large amounts of grain was sent down the Mississippi River for shipment to the West Indies and back to Europe. Now. Uh, we go into England's search for empire, and as we usually do, we need to start by identifying the major causes or motives leading to the British colonial impulse. Um, first and foremost, uh, eventual peace with Spain uh, provided opportunities overseas without the harassment uh, that had previously gone on between the two nations. Uh, and again, uh, if you've taken European history, remember 1588 marked the uh, Spanish Armada, and that was a big change in foreign policy between France and between England. You also had population growth, which created massive surpluses of workers, many of them who became potential colonists, because the fact is they didn't 
have much chance or uh, much uh, economic opportunity back home. Unemployment and economic opportunity um, became an important factor, and you got to understand that there was an abundance of farmland um, in, in, in the colonies. Most of the land in England was owned and passed down generation to generation as a result of primogeniture. Um, adventure, stagnation in the economy had, had created potential for adventure and possible wealth, possible advancements for ordinary lower and middle class people not just generals um, and soldiers only. So these people were looking for new ways to profit. Uh, new markets and political freedom also were big causes uh, for many in England who were not represented uh, represented, excuse me, by Parliament. Uh, also, religious freedom was a big deal. Anglican Church under the Stuarts was trying to use the church as a tool of absolution or absolutism and were forcing conformity on people looking to quote-unquote purify the church. Remember that because we're going to talk about Puritans. Uh, social change was another uh, you know, big factor. Get people out of England who were suffering as a result of the population explosion and bad economic times. Another key motive was the joint stock companies. As I always say, one of the most significant inventions of Western civilization if you've taken Euro. Um, they provided the financial means to get colonies, colonists to come overseas. Uh, and what ended up happening was investors pulled resources for sea expeditions. Um, you, you take, for instance, uh, basically what joint stock companies do is they disperse risk by allowing multiple investors from all walks of life to invest whatever income, extra money uh, that they have in capital for exploring and expeditions. Uh, examples of these are East India Company, Virginia Company. It's basically the basis of our stock exchange uh, in the United States today. By no means am I wealthy, but I do have some stocks for my retirement. So again, uh, it allows schmucks like me to invest uh, in profiting uh, companies. England's existence in the colonial game can't be evaluated without analyzing their fierce competition with Spain and then of course later France. Uh, first and foremost, Protestant England versus Catholic Spain during the late 16th century was all the norm. You had Elizabeth I versus uh, Philip II. Elizabeth had funded and supported the Dutch revolt against the rule of Catholic Spain and Philip II. Philip in turn sponsored assassination plots like uh, the one that Mary, Queen of Scots, was implicated in, and eventually sent his armada to take care of England once and for all. It didn't turn out too well for Spain, thanks to divine intervention of the so-called Protestant wind, or, if you're not really religious, bad weather in the English Channel and around Ireland. There's some Euro humor for you if you've taken AP Euro. Anyway, the significance of the armada was the fact that it helped England ensure England's naval dominance in the North Atlantic and later the Atlantic Sea routes to North America. By 1604, a peace treaty, which was known as the Treaty of London, was signed between England and Spain, ending almost 16 years of war between the two nations. Um, then you had England uh, able to participate in the game a little bit more. John Cabot, uh, also known as Giovanni Cabato, uh, in 1497-98 to explored the coast of Newfoundland to Virginia on behalf of England, looking for the Northwest Passage. He found no passage to India. There were no settlement, but that what they did discover was great fishing. Next, you had Sir Francis Drake, uh, leader of the Sea Dogs. He pirated Spanish ships on the high seas, netted heavy profits uh, to his financial backers, including Queen Elizabeth. After one raiding excursion, Drake escaped by becoming the first Englishman to circumnavigate the globe. Elizabeth showed her approval by knighting him, which infuriated Spain. In their eyes, he was a thief, robber, pirate, or, like we said, a sea dog. When Elizabeth showed outward approval, Philip decided it was time to send his armada to England. Bad mood by Phil, as we've already established. But uh, nonetheless, English attempts to colonize in the late 16th century got off to a horrendous uh, start, to say the least. But remember, it's not where you start, it's where you finish. 1583, Sir Humphrey Gilbert attempted to colonize Newfoundland, but died while at sea. Not a good thing to do. Uh, and the second attempt came, to, it came at Roanoke in 1585 when Sir Walter Raleigh, who was Gilbert's half-brother, led 115 men, women, and children to Roanoke Island off the coast of Virginia, and they, as legend has it, mysteriously vanished. This concludes Lecture Cast 4. Um, again, please go back and uh, you know, make sure that you go over the vocabulary and answer any of those questions um, on the uh, Lecture Cast assignment sheet. Again, as always, if you have any questions, just email me, uh, sieg at kosd.org. Thank you very much. Enjoy your summer.